Hi, everyone. On behalf of the World Health Organization Department of Aging and Life Course and the International Federation on Aging, I'd like to welcome you to the inaugural webinar of 2019 on age-friendly environments. Today's webinar is titled Age-Friendly Housing, Promoting Healthy Spaces for All Ages, and will feature presentations from uh, the WHO and from winners of the Innovation at Home contest, which was uh, WHO and Grantmakers in Aging initiative. The Innovation at Home contest was introduced to identify successful age-friendly housing innovations around the world. Um, on behalf of the IFA, I'd like to thank our presenters for being with us today um, and invite all participants to ask questions via the questions tab on GoToWebinars. Um, all questions will be given time at the end of the webinar, but if your question isn't answered, I'd invite you to email uh, the IFA and ask the question that way. Um, you'll also receive further information in a wrap-up email at the end of the webinar. So thank you for listening, and I look forward to hearing your questions at the end of the webinar. Um, I'd like to now pass the presentation on to Ramona. Okay, hello everyone. So my name is Ramona Ludov. I'm working as a technical officer at WHO headquarters in Geneva. And um, I'm working mainly on WHO's housing and health related activities, as well as on health and all policies approaches. And we're very excited to be able to talk at this webinar today about our housing related work and give you a bit more information about the recently published WHO housing and health guidelines. Just a brief outline of our presentation today. So I'll quickly talk about the relevance of housing for sustainable development and public health, WHO's response to this increasing need, and then give a short outlook on our planned activities in the future. So housing is becoming increasingly important, and this goes on a general level. So the world's urban population is expected to double by 2050, and of course, they will also require housing solutions. And then from a more specific perspective, we're also expecting the population aged over 60 years to, um, to double by 2050, and they will require more specific housing solutions. Plus, there are changing weather patterns associated with climate change, and this also calls for need to adapt the way we live and the way we reside in our housing to climate change. So we see that there's a global relevance of the issue of housing, and this goes for high, middle, and low-income countries, and regardless of geographic region. If we then look a bit more into housing related to health at the global development agenda, we can also answer the question why WHO is working on housing. And this is simply because we perceive housing as a public health issue. So when we think about the social, uh, the, the sustainable development goals, we see that housing can contribute to the achievement of several of those SDGs. One, the one being SDG number three related to health, but also when we think about healthy cities, number 11, or about quality education, how housing can improve people's ability to stay at home to study and learn and develop. So we see that housing is a cross-cutting issue that requires multi-sectoral attention. If we think now about housing from a health perspective, I just would like to show you this diagram to highlight how manifold the ways are in which housing can affect human health. And just to name a view, we can see that housing influences, for example, are cardiovascular disease, our respiratory health, mental health, well-being. It can lead to infectious diseases. Um, it can have an influence on whether cancer is developed. It can influence our, our hearing. And it can also lead to injuries if there is poor housing. And if we go down in this diagram, we see that there are a lot of different pathways through which housing can influence our health. So we think that it is a very important public health issue, even though it's not always perceived as this when we think about housing in the first place. So WHO's response to this increasing need of having healthy housing for all, across all ages, WHO has developed the WHO Housing and Health Guidelines. And this has happened also on a request from member states who wanted to have more guidance on how to deal with this issue of housing from a health perspective. And we also hope that these guidelines will increase visibility of housing in the health sector. 
Um, just a few words on, uh, on the content of the guidelines and what they aim to do. So they set global norms and standards based on the best available evidence. That means that we had a thorough review of evidence of all the single topics that are covered in the guidelines and then based our recommendations given in the guidelines on this evidence. They focus on an entire sector instead of just a single disease or a single issue of housing and as such give a very comprehensive perspective on the topic of housing and health. We hope that these guidelines will enable the health sector to inform other sectors about how housing impacts health and then that we find together solutions on how to work together to make housing healthy and suitable for everyone. And so they mainly target policymakers that will then formulate policies that take health into consideration when talking about housing um, policies and regulations, but also implementing actors who wouldn't carry out the recommendations made in the guidelines. Just a few words on the process of guideline development at WHO to contextualize a bit more the information we give in the guidelines. And this is a very rigorous process you have to follow. This is a standardized process. So usually we identify priority issue, have a member state request, and then have a standardized development procedure. We convene experts for a guideline development group, an internal steering committee, and external peer reviews to make sure that we have experts from all fields that we cover, and also can combine from various geographical regions, from various sectors, all the experts to make sure we have a very comprehensive stake on the issue we address. We then commission systematic reviews to compile the best available evidence and blend this systematic review evidence with considerations of feasibility, costs, acceptability, benefits and harms to ensure that we're not just looking at evidence per se, but also put this into context and see how member states can then implement the recommendations we give. The recommendations are formulated by the guideline development group with based on this evidence and these considerations in mind. And the guidelines then undergo an external review process before a guideline review committee in-house approves the guidelines and has again a thorough look at them. In terms of context, the content, the WHO housing and health guidelines make new recommendations on areas such as crowding, indoor temperatures that includes excess indoor heat and cold, as well as insulation, home injury prevention and accessibility. And we provide a summary of existing WHO guidelines that link to housing that cover indoor air pollution, toxic materials, noise and water sanitation and hygiene. So when we talk about age-friendly housing, accessibility is, a major, is of major importance and this is why I would like to focus especially on this chapter of the guidelines. So we have a race of functional impairments in aging societies, yet most homes are not yet built with accessibility in mind. And we expect that these functional impairments are also going to increase as the world population ages. When we look into experience of people with functional impairments, we see that they often face discrimination and higher costs when looking for housing. But we also recognize that environmental factors mainly determine whether an impairment is perceived as disabling or not. That means if we provide accessible housing to an aging population, we will also make sure that people can live longer and more independent in their own home. So if we have accessible housing, we can improve a person's domain specific functioning. If we do not have accessible housing, we run into the risk of having more falls and injuries. It will restrict social participation and also negatively affect quality of life. So the way how people age in their homes is mainly determined by how we build their housing. Therefore, we gave a recommendation that is called based on current and projected national prevalence of population populations with functional impairments and taking into account trends of aging, an adequate proportion of the housing stock should be accessible to people with functional impairments. So that means based on the, the trends we see in a specific country, as adequate stock meaning covering all these people of accessible housing needs to be provided. We give this recommendation because we do know that it's 
much more cost effective to build housing that includes key accessibility features than to retrofit them. So if we build new housing, it totally makes sense to, to build with accessibility and an aging society in mind. And we also think that accessible housing should also consider other factors related to healthy housing. Example, through universal design to make sure that all residents can live in this house. And to implement this at country level, we think that the public and private sector are required to work together. So to give you an outlook of what we intend to do with these guidelines now, is we want to work together with our partners from academia, NGOs, some member states to develop an implementation strategy to have tools and guidance that are adapted to country specific priorities and needs. The situation is always different depending on where we go. There are always different priorities. So we need to make sure that our guidelines really meet the needs that are in a specific country. And we want to do so by having different tools like situation analysis tool, a gap analysis, um, an institutional assessment of what is already there in terms of actors and who can work together. And we'd like to enrich this with a collection of good practice interventions, model legislation, and case studies. And we further think that it's very important that we all work together for housing conditions to improve. And that means we also need to have capacity building and information that promote multi-sectoral action, as housing is inherently a topic that is not just placed, or well, not really placed in the health sector, but has a lot of influence on health. We need to see how we can speak with other sectors to make sure that we all work towards the same goal, to have cost-effective solutions, potentially also having a lot of co-benefits, so address climate change with less emissions, have accessible housing for aging societies, but at the same time also being implementable for, for a reasonable price for countries. So we think multi-sexual action is the key here. And um, we would be delighted if you would go on our website and read more about what we do in terms of housing and health in general. And if you have any questions that go beyond this, we'd be happy to, to answer. And you can always write to us and get in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ladoff. Um, at this point, I'd like to hand it over to Sybil. Sybil is from Age Friendly Sausalito, and she's going to give an example of an age friendly practice that uh, was used in Sausalito. So, Sybil, I will transfer to you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm honored to be with you today. My name is Sybil Boutillier, and I am a chair of Age Friendly Sausalito in California, USA, and uh, also on the Commission on Aging uh, here in our county of uh, Marin County. So I um, want to share with you how a small group of older citizens was able to bring about a new housing program and policy scale it up and make it sustainable. South Salido is a small bayside city at the other end of the Golden Gate Bridge from San Francisco. Our population is uh, small, 7,500 persons, and we're already more than um, one third of the population is age 60 or over in our town. So this is significantly higher than the national average of 21% and the count in the county of Marin's average of uh, 27%, which is projected to increase another 35% by 2030. So uh, faced with this data and experiencing our own concerns about aging in place in our community, um, our small group of elders decided to ask our city council to appoint a task force to explore how the city could be more age friendly and to get their agreement uh, to apply to join the World Health Organization's Global Network of Age Friendly Cities and Communities with the concomitant commitment to undertake a five year plan of uh, assessment and age friendly improvements. 
So our all volunteer task force was uh, comprised of uh, older adults in the community, developed and conducted a survey instrument encompassing the eight domains of livability, which we mailed to city residents age 55 or older. So 2,400 people received them and uh, with return uh, mailing, and we got a 50% return, which was remarkable and so helpful. And housing was one of the particular concerns. Over 95% said it was important or very important to stay in their community, to continue to engage in social activities here and uh, to remain in their own homes as they age. But almost half of them said the design of their homes would not make it easy to remain there as they grow older. And um, 38 different uh, survey respondents wrote in comments that they would like to make home adaptations um, and several added comments saying the process was too arduous, confusing or expensive to undertake. So a particular concern in our community is the fear and incidence of falls uh, because most homes in South Salido are located on steep hills. Most have multiple levels and entry stairs um, and uh, the incidence of falls are the number one reason that older persons in our community get transported to hospital. And uh, the fact that 44% of persons aged 60 and older in South Salido do live alone uh, exacerbates the, the danger of uh, injury from a fall. And as uh, research has, has shown, even the fear of falling uh, can isolate older adults in their home, uh, causing withdrawal from community life, depression, and uh, can result in an overall decline in health. Um, being isolated from public transportation in our residential areas um, adds to that uh, situation when somebody becomes um, injured uh, from a fall and loses their uh, mobility. And you can see the figures here um, in our country and, uh, and in our um, county, it's, uh, we have the same issues. So armed with all this data, uh, our little task force held a community meeting about home modification. And uh, we invited the city building inspector and um, one of our um, associates, a retired age-friendly architect. And we discussed the range of age-friendly adaptations and also the complexity of building permits and their costs. And it was decided by the group in um, this discussion that we would work with the city to try to figure out how to streamline the building permit process for older adults so more people would be encouraged rather than disincentivized to make their homes more accessible and safe. A few of us including our age-friendly architect, worked for a little over a year with the city to craft a new age-friendly permit policy with better pricing and a clear, simple procedure. We reviewed hundreds of modifications and how they'd fit into a policy scheme that would work with a budget the city could accept. And this was finally adopted by the city council late last year. The city had to agree to forego a portion of building permit fees, which the state housing code authorizes them to collect. So a budget agreement was part of the planning process and an initial cap was set, which uh, the city included in its biannual budget in which they could augment as time went, goes on. So building permit fees are calculated based on the, based on the the total of the project. We're getting a big uh, feedback now. Um, uh, echo. I hope other people can hear clearly. Okay. Building permit fees are calculated based on the total construction cost of the project. So the age-friendly building permit is free 
for accessibility modifications to homes and or apartments uh, based on construction costs up to ten thousand um, dollars, which of course would be different in uh, different uh, countries and cities. Um, it's available to any resident age sixty and also younger adults with any any sort of a limiting condition. And renters are eligible with landlord approval for making permanent modifications. So each eligible resident can have two permits per year. So that gives them free permits for a total of $20,000 worth of accessible home modifications. And uh, eligibility is based on who is living in the home or apartment. It must be an older person or a younger person with a limiting condition. So here's an example of a project that's eligible for a no cost uh, friendly, age friendly permit as construction costs are less than $10,000. So this was a, a new ramp to a front door uh, with handrails and an on-slip surface. Other things that would fit into that cost would be uh, uh, a chair climbing, uh, a stair climbing chair, uh, some simple uh, outdoor lifts, um, uh, possibly widening a doorway and uh, some other types of changes. Um, when the total cost of the project is more than $10,000, that amount's deducted from the calculation for the permit fee. And the cost of the permit is based on the remainder of the construction cost. So for this bathroom remodel, which included more than $10,000 in accessible improvements, the permit was based on $14,000 rather than the total job of $24,000. So that uh, gave the, um, the homeowner a, a reduced fee of about 30%. And in some cases, it can be up to you know, 50% or so, depending on the overall cost of all the changes they're making, including those that don't have to do with accessibility. And of course, they can get two permits a year. Um, and there's no limit as to how soon you can have the second one within the year. So two parts of a larger construction project could take place within a couple of months. So along the way, uh, we benefited from the generous sharing of resources by other organizations working to create age-friendly environments. And this is one of the great things about being part of the, uh, the WHO's global network um, because the exchange between the other cities and the other agencies have been just wonderful, a wonderful advantage for us all. And I particularly wanted to acknowledge Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corp. They generously allowed us to license and customize an earlier version of their home modification guide for seniors to use in our community. As um, And they were developing a new one for Canadians, which is just wonderful. Um, localizing the guide helped us to get our community thinking about the kinds of adaptations needed in their own homes. Um, Marin Community Foundation provided a small grant so we could print copies of the guide and we've distributed them widely. Now there are some excellent guides that have been made available uh, for use by um, other advocates. And I, uh, the new updated guide created by the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corp, maintaining senior independence through home adaptation is available in English or French versions. And the AARPs Home Fit Guide is available in English and Spanish, and both can be downloaded online for free or ordered in hard copy. And I've listed their URL addresses on this slide and highly recommend them both. So Age Friendly South Salido was excited about the potential for this program and was hoping others would adopt and replicate it. So we promoted the program to other stakeholders and policymakers and advocated for scaling it up. Our state assembly member, um, Mark Levine, understood the value of the program and introduced a bill in the state legislature inspired by our South Salido program and our advocacy. And age-friendly advocates and members of the county 
Commission on Aging and other stakeholders worked with legislative staff, testified at the state hearings to advocate for passage of the bill. And California Assembly Bill 2132, building permit waiver for seniors was passed in September of uh, 2018. So rather than issuing a mandate, the bill amends the state housing code to authorize cities and counties in California to create county and municipal ordinances to waive or reduce building permit fees for home adaptations for persons age 60 or older who have any limiting condition. And so there may be different versions put into place by different jurisdictions to reflect the needs of their unique communities. Um, but all of these serve as an incentive for people to um, think about and to make changes in their dwellings to make them more um, accessible. And Marin County is now taking steps to explore making changes to its code and create an ordinance to implement a model that other counties in the state could follow. So with the simplification, and cost incentives for permits and public education. We're optimistic about reducing the risk of falls in the home among older persons in our communities while providing an increase in accessible housing stock now and for the future to enable more persons to age in place in their own homes in safety and comfort and good health. So I'd like to thank the World Health Organization, Grant Makers in Aging, for honoring Age-Friendly Salsalito with the Innovation at Home Award, the International Federation on Aging for this opportunity to share our program, and the World Health Organization, and you, the attendees, for joining us. Thank you all. Thank you, Sybil, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, I think you hit on a number of important points, which uh, the first being the desire to, for older people um, to remain in their own homes, um, the danger of falls uh, in limiting people's ability to do that, and then the need to collaborate uh, across sectors to adapt homes for, for various needs. So thank you for that. At this point, I'd like to switch over to Luis Berrios, um, and Luis will be presenting on Barcelona. Um, thank you, Jessica. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm very glad to be with you. Thank you for your kind invitation. I'm covering my colleague Gemma uh, because a uh, health issue. So I will try to, to make my best. Um, so first, my presentation will uh, explain some issues about my, our organization, our duties, then explaining some uh, key aspects of our program uh, and uh, finally with some uh, key aspects or results we have uh, obtained through these 10 years of implementation. Um, so we are the Barcelona Provincial Council, we are a network of municipalities. Uh, our our objective is to ensure the provision of municipal services and to support the work of government and our competences are, are in order to coordinate municipal services and uh, provide technical and economic assistance. Um, I think that our, our main objective is to, to create this, to create and maintain this network of municipalities uh, to, to improve the local uh, services and, and warranty our territorial um, equity. So the Barcelona province, we are the largest population in our region, Catalonia. We have uh, 5.5 5 million of inhabitants, the 73% uh, of Catalonia total population. And we have 311 municipalities, mainly small, small and, and medium-sized um, municipalities. And uh, these 311, we only attend 310 because the, the Barcelona city has their own um, system. So we have more uh, near to 200 municipalities that have less than 
5,000 inhabitants. So our uh, department, we are in charge of uh, the social welfare, education and equality policies, and uh, public health and consumer affairs. Our mission is to contribute and cooperation always on an agreement with local councils to ensuring this, this public uh, welfare. Uh, we provide services covering the people's whole life, um, from the uh, schools and and from rest, uh, attending all other people, and uh, always trying to to intervene with the most vulnerable groups. Um, so we are a network and we provide all these kinds of support in terms of uh, technical, material, economic support, training, information systems, uh, social uh, providing uh, uh, um, attention and support to social organizations and municipalities. So let, let me now start talking about our, our program, the home home refurbishment program. The aim of the, our program is to, to uh, guarantee minimum levels of accessibility, um, safety, hygiene, habitability, and energy efficiency in the homes of the most vulnerable elderly and disabled people. The energy efficiency is a new feature of the program, so we still have enough uh, information to to offer you um, some results. Uh, the, the aim of uh, is to meet the challenge of an aging population. We have the 80, 18 percent of population in, in the province is over 65 years, and 33 percent of them has more than 80 years old. So we try to enable people to live for longer in their own homes, within their communities, their natural communities. So we want to improve their well-being by keeping elderly people in their natural environment, facilitating, uh, you know, community ties, international relationships, and the environment conducting to, to a healthy uh, aging. So we think that maintaining their own spaces and networks of relationships uh, while delaying the need for institutionalization. Uh, we also aim to strengthen and improve local authorities, social welfare policies and actions in the Barcelona area. And what kinds of uh, or, or types of intervention we do in our program? Basically, uh, our interventions aim to improving accessibility and facilitate personal hygiene. Uh, if we see the data, mainly we, we try to replace the bath tube to uh, replacing the bath tube to shower stalls. Uh, it represents the 73%. Uh, but also interventions aim mainly to add improve safety with regard to daily activities in the kitchen, uh, general refurbishment as interventions, to trying to adapting and providing support in the general home environment to facilitate general mobility of the person in all the spaces at home, and additional actions to, actions to improve home energy uh, efficiency. As I said before, small interventions to, to supplement the above with the aim of improving uh, energy efficiency in, in homes, replacing, replacing uh, windows or doors. And finally, some uh, technical aids to provide beneficiaries with devices to help them move, communicate, and improve their rest. Uh, this this is this uh, technical light um, was an innovation in the latest also in in the in the latest implementation of the program. You can see now some some pictures about the the, the bathroom refurbishment, which is. As, uh, the main intervention, around 97% of the interventions are in the bathroom uh, uh, ins installations. And 77, uh, as, as I said before, are replacing the bath tube um, to, to more safety um, devices. About our target group, the program was designed to reach 
people aged over 65 who are in situation of frailty due to age, to health, uh, lack of personal autonomy, disability, uh, or dependence or living alone or with another elderly person or with financial difficulties. The local social services are in charge to identify and, uh, and make an initial evaluation of the person situation uh, at, the, at their, their at the cities. And recently, the program was ex extended to people aged under 65, but with uh, disabilities. Now we have uh, uh, more or less 30% uh, of our beneficiaries are, are um, with disabilities and are uh, aged under 60, 65. The priority uh, of, our, of the program is, gives, is, is oriented to people with financial difficulties, people who have their disabilities or dependency stages uh, legally accredited, and people over 80 years of age living alone or with another elderly, elderly person. This is the main uh, stakeholders uh, inter who, who intervene in the, in the program. As you see, we have many figures, so it's, uh, it, 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 is, it represents a complexity in terms of coordination and, and the management model. Uh, we, we are the Barcelona Provincial Council, we, we lead and coordinate and uh, we try to promote uh, and finance the, the program. And um, the program is implemented by three of our uh, departments, the welfare services uh, within a, a, I'm working, we offer the management, the management department, the, and we are responsible for the design, the preparation, the planning, the public uh, procedure, procurement, and uh, funding and communication. Then we also uh, need our internal contracting service, and this department supervises the drawing of the drawing up of the service and technical administrative specifications for calls for service tenders, and organizes and manages the whole tender uh, process. And we also need the support of our general secretary who authorizes the administrative specifications. And this is uh, three of our offices who are coordinate uh, the program. And then, then we, ha we have the uh, a company specialized in, fun in functional adaptation of homes, and they are responsible for managing the intervention projects. And it provides the program with uh, figures, professional figures as architects, coordinators, social workers, and it designs the, the, all the technical framework of interventions and monitor them. And the interventions, the refurbishment, are executed by another uh, companies. They are building companies contracted by, by Barcelona Provincial Council. Then we have the local authorities, as the the closest government to the public and they participate identifying and targeting uh, beneficiaries and homes for the program and uh, in some cases by co-funding the work uh, since uh, the 2000 the 2019 there is no co-funding for the municipalities but in, depending of the of each situation they can decide to apply some kind of, of co-payment for beneficiaries the beneficiaries participate assessing the, the program and offering their views, which, have, which uh, has helped to adapt and improve the interventions. The, the partnership approach based on, on, on the, the person's expressed needs. And finally, and finally uh, but uh, not less uh, important, the third sector social organization are very interested in this program and they help us through um, the, the signing and, and make some kind of public, publishing the program among their users and referring potential ben beneficiaries. Uh, in terms of, of uh, financing, 
we provide the 80 the 80 percent of this of the budget municipalities participate in the 20 percent but this uh, uh since 2000 since 2090 it is for free for them the average cost per intervention i think is uh, quite high uh, it's 1.5 thousand euros so this this average cost is for the 20 um 18 and and, and uh, uh, the 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 beginning of the program uh so in terms of uh, the impact uh well in in the period in the in the period of uh, 2009 and 2015 a total of 153 local councils took part, covering over 85% of the population in the Barcelona area, the Barcelona the province area, and uh, 6.3 thousand refurbishment have been carried out since 2009, benefiting a total of uh, more than 10,000 people. I think um, the, the the profile of of the beneficiaries is mainly uh, women, uh, which represents the seventy percent. In the an average age that cover from the seventy five to 90, 90 years old, it represents the sixty more than sixty uh, percent. And uh, the 55 percent of people who, who are beneficiaries of the program lives uh, with other uh, with other person, many uh, partner. Um, in 2009, the people living alone represented the 11 percent, while in the last implementation, this was 67 percent. Maybe this change, we think it's uh, it's due to possible change in priorities established by the the city the city councils uh, to to better adapt more adequately to the to their users needs. Um, uh, in terms of effectiveness and efficiency, um, the the data we have evaluating the program. We have found that the 80, 80, more than 80 percent of cases beneficiaries are people with a high level of autonomy, uh, and that confirms to us the preventive um, nature of the program. And in terms of personal autonomy, uh, after the interventions, the percentage of people unable to carry out daily activities at home without help from someone else dropped by 24 percent i mean from from 55 to 31. the the in terms of accessibility another main goal of the program the number of people who could not access uh, certain certain uh, spaces in their home without help dropped by 20 percent after the refurbishment work uh, in terms of safety around 90% uh, of the beneficiaries state the beneficiaries they, they feel completely safe in perform, performing daily activities themselves before the intervention it represented only the 2% uh, and uh, in terms of comfort around 94% of the beneficiaries uh, said they have uh, they have uh, a comfort in performing daily activities at home and before the intervention it represented only the two percent um, in terms of quality of life 80 percent of the the beneficiaries improved a lot the quality and 20 percent said they have quite improved the, the quality of life so i think as conclusions or key aspects of this uh, of this program um first I, I we think that housing age-friendly housing solutions for living better conditions uh and 
to guarantee more time at home, um, it's it, it affects the three the three levels of action: the person, the environment, and our policies. And uh, I think the more a person is in their home, which uh, can can affect the 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 living with more autonomy of the elderly, and it facilitates the social activation and uh, the intervention of, care of caregivers and all programs um, that can uh, also permit to the people live in their homes, like the telecare, like home health services. Um, and secondly, I think it's a challenge, this intergovernment inter uh, cooperation, because uh, we are talking about the provincial level, the municipalities, the public private cooperation to offer a home accessibility service to all municipalities in the Barcelona province, including this is small, the smallest ones with an older population and few resources. Uh, other governments uh, bodies in Spain or in our region are trying to implement similar um, programs but normally are uh, oriented to offer grants to people and not to contract the um, contract um, the companies and to assume all the managing the, the managing uh, of the of the program. Uh, we also try to to make a multidisciplinary multidisciplinary approach and a person center um, uh, view. And uh, we try to in, to include the specialists such as physiotherapists, social workers, architects, who, based on a detailed analysis of each situation, propose a specific solutions for functional adaptation of the home to the needs of each person. Uh, the needs of the person come before the service or solution uh, available, and um, I think the. This involves a change in parting regarding accessibility, focusing more on functional adaptation of the different elements in the home to the person's characteristics. And it, is, it permits to maximize autonomy, not to encourage uh, dependency. Um, the participation of small uh, municipalities uh, under 5,000 inhabitants and rural municipalities in the program also uh, favors the the territorial balance and equality in social policies and uh, finally uh, we think we are trying to uh, to in include this uh, gender perspective because the main beneficiaries of the program have been women and people aged over 80 thus uh, impacting on the most vulnerable groups of elderly people uh, the fact uh, that municipal social services are responsible for identifying and selecting the program beneficiaries uh, guarantees uh, that it effectively targets people in the most uh, fragile social situations. Uh, well, uh, finishing, only say that we are now re rethinking our management model, trying to to planning a best cooperation ways with uh, local services and trying to 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 a, a more simple uh, model. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Um, I will be glad to answer some questions. Thank you, Luisa. It's not easy to step in at the last moment, and that was a great presentation. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to switch over to Raquel Castello Branco. She's um, from Portugal. So, Raquel, go ahead. So, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Raquel Castelo Branco and I'm the head of the Social Cohesion Department of the Porto City Council. Uh, I want to start by thanking the International um, Federation on Aging for the invitation to participate in this webinar and for the opportunity to present the Aconchego program. Uh, this program was one of the three winners of the Innovation at Home competition promoted by uh, World 
health organization and grant makers in aging and we were very honored to receive it so um the Aconchego program was implemented in the city of Porto in 2004 by the Porto City Council in partnership with the Academic Federation of Porto, that is a student's association of the University of Porto. And why did we do it? If um, we look at the numbers of the last census in Porto in 2011, uh, you can see we had a very aged population around 30% of the citizens of Porto have more than 60 years and almost 31,000 persons with more than 65 years were living alone. And this was in 2011. Today, uh, these numbers are higher, as you well know, due to the increase of average life expectancy. At the same time, the city of Porto has a high number of students in higher education in 2018, public and private universities of Porto have around 58,000 students that were matriculated. A great part of these students come from other cities or even for, from foreign countries, and they have uh, difficulties in finding a place to live. So already in 2004, we knew that there were a great amount of older people that lived alone, and that was isolated and feeling loneliness. We also had, at that time, another problem that was uh, the increase of students that were coming to study, to study to, to Porto. And that had to find a home that was not cheap. They also had to adapt themselves to a new environment, separated from uh, their original families. Thus, a complementary solution was developed consisting of a housing system in which older people who have adequate housing conditions host students who need accommodation. So we found a solution to respond to, to problems. This initiative offers benefits for both parts. It's a win-win situation. For the seniors who share their home, they get a close relationship they gain company on a day-to-day -day basis, fight the feeling of loneliness and age in an active way. For the students who offer their company, they receive accommodation and enjoy a better integration in a new city. And besides the cost reduction, they gain a positive and home-like environment that improves their performance at university. So the main goals of this program are to address social isolation and loneliness in older people, to promote relationships between two generations, to promote seniors' quality of life, and to help students and their families to reduce accommodation costs and facilitate the integration of the students in a new city. So which seniors can participate in the program? So citizens aged 60 or over, to be a resi resident in the municipality of Porto, living alone or with spouse, have adequate housing conditions to accommodate a student of higher education. So which students can also participate? So students enrolled in higher education, aged between 18 and 35, non-residents in the city of Porto, and that have the domain of the Portuguese language. So how do we implement the program? Uh, a technical team of the, the municipality interviews the students and just admits the ones that have the required profile. The same process is followed for older people. The team visits their houses to verify if there are adequate housing conditions and also analyzes the profile of the senior. Then, after an extensive analysis of both profiles, senior and student, the team makes the match between the student and the senior. Then we promote a first meeting without compromise. In case of empathy and desire to move towards integration, an agreement is signed. This agreement defines the rules of the Conchego program. So then the integration occurs. And at this moment, we also support uh, the integration of the student uh, when he moves to the, the, the old the senior's house. 
So during uh, the period of the scholar year, uh, the pairs are accompanied by the technical team. We make regular visits, we keep contact through email or telephone, and we promote an annual meeting where we have the opportunity to evaluate the program. Monitoring is vital because it allows us to control and manage unforeseen situations, allowing the adoption of corrective measures if necessary. We also evaluate the compliance with the clauses contained in the agreement that was signed. Concerning the evaluation of the program, we conduct interviews, observation and application of questionnaires to the participants, their families, and also to the technicians. Concerning the results, uh, older people report great satisf uh, satisfaction with intergenerational relationships provided by the program. Moreover, the majority of the candidates say that they want to join the program to have company, especially during the night. The students report that besides the benefits of the cost reductions, they gain a home-like environment that increases their performance at university. So uh, a Conchego program allows collective benefits since this interaction encourages the creation of informal networks of mutual support through the involvement of local institutions, neighbors and family members. In fact, the program increases the seniors' quality of life and produces a positive impact on the extended family of both participants. This program can be replicated in other cities, in other countries, where there are isolated seniors and students who need accommodation. So uh, we developed a replication guide that allows uh, replication of the program in other territories. So to finish, uh, I want to highlight that the main constraint that arises in the program is to find the right, the right match, meaning choose the appropriate students to match with the appropriate older people. Therefore, we make a deep and extensive analysis of both profiles to achieve the right match. And after they start living together, uh, we visit their homes regularly uh, to evaluate the development of their relationship. These visits are very, very important for the evaluation of the program since they allow us to understand if we really have done the right match. So uh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm uh, uh, available for the questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raquel, for that wonderful presentation. Um, I think there was a, a good theme between the last two presentations and the first one as well, uh, which is the importance of community and of remaining uh, in one's own community and also uh, adapting to financial constraints. Um, so thank you for all of those presentations. Um, we just have a short time for questions, so I'll ask as many as I can. Um, and around uh, five after the hour, I will probably um, uh, stop with the questions. So if you have further questions, again, don't hesitate to contact us. Um, so the first question, which is for everybody, is in the cities and projects featured, is the need to repair poor quality housing a bigger issue than the need to build new housing? So whoever whoever has an answer can go ahead. Okay. Did everyone hear that? <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll move on to the next question then um, while you think of an answer to the first one. Um, the next question is, for housing, what were some of the biggest challenges you experienced in balancing public and private interests as you developed and maintained a public-private relationship to deliver your program? Luis? Yes. Um, in, our, in our program, uh, indeed, we have two companies. We have, we have contract two companies. One, we, we could call them experts and another that are the, the direct providers of the refurbishment. Uh, I think it's a challenge to balance this relationship. 
and sometimes we feel that the company, uh, the, the experts company had a lot of information, a lot of control uh, on the program. So now, as I said, we're trying to change this balance of uh, responsibilities, duties, uh, and uh, at the end of, of power in the in the program. So, because we are we are leading this program from the social perspective, not from the the, the architecture perspective, uh, is, um, as you know. So um, we are trying to to offer more autonomy to the to the local services. So because they had uh, the councils. They had their own architects, and we are trying to to um, to collaborate more more with with them. I I I, I don't know. I, I'm clear myself. You are you are very clear. Uh, thank you for for that answer. Um, the next question is for Raquel, um, and the question is: What did the demographic data look like for both students and older people? And did you find a discrepancy with regard to gender when you were looking at that data? Uh, you are asking about today, the data for today. Yes, well, what you presented today. Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, yes, we had an increase uh, today. Uh, we think that today we have around uh, 50, 50, around 51,000 uh, people that are living alone. So the, the, the numbers increased and, and we have to, so we have more uh, people that are needing this uh, response. I don't know if it was that the answer. That's, no, that's great. Thank you. Was for... that question? <laughs> um, okay, so, okay, so the next question is directed at both uh, uh, Luis and Sybil. And the question is, for the funds offered through the home refurbishment program and the age-friendly home adaptation permit policy, where does the funding come from, i.e. the province or state or the municipality from which budget? Luis or Sybil? Okay. Um, the the phone no, the no, funds. No. Uh, sorry, do you hear? Do you hear me? Yes. The the funding from um, I think since the two two thousand and nineteen, we are trying to to cover all the the budget of the program. The main. Uh, the main ways uh, for the, the main budget of the Barcelona Provincial Council comes from the state, but we can uh, administrate it with a lot of autonomy. Uh, a lot of autonomy. Uh, if it always is oriented to to the duties of the local uh, the, the, from the local um, government. And, uh, the municipalities now are, uh, are at least this 2019 program edition will it's not necessary to them to contribute uh, financially to the program thank you uh, Sybil do you have an answer for this question I can repeat it if you'd like oh hi can you hear me now yes yes oh good uh, yes but I uh, I, I will answer this one, but I also wanted to make a quick comment about your first question. Um, I was sure. muted before. But sure. um, in terms of the uh, age friendly permit uh, program, uh, the way that works is that the city has uh, put aside a, um, a budget amount which they are willing to forego in what they normally would collect for the full prices of building permits that are applied for and um, at the moment that is uh, $10,000 per period and when that amount is is reached then um, the finance uh, uh, committee uh, reviews the budget and see if they and sees if they have more funding uh, for that year to um, uh, add more to that um, program and so far it's been sufficient to cover the cost so it's um, really the money that the city is willing to forego and they allow for it in they budget for that 
in their um, annual budgeting process. So that's how that works. And then, of course, the individual pays for anything outside of that. Um, and then I just wanted to say one comment about the first question, which is, of course, the, um, the question had to do with whether the amount of housing available was uh, as important or more important or more of a challenge at this point than accessibility. And I will just like to comment that housing, the lack of sufficient affordable housing or uh, housing with universal design is a big issue um, in our city and in our county, in our whole state, as a matter of fact. And um, so that is an issue um, that is being very uh, much looked at right now. And uh, there's quite a bit of effort at the state level uh, with a number of bills that have been uh, introduced and budgets that are being um, looked at. Uh, at the uh, governor's office and the state legislature to uh, deal with that issue because it definitely is a concern um, that we are short of housing for sure. Thank you. That's uh, your comments are appreciated and uh, uh, glad you uh, were able to unmute. Um, we're closing in on the end of the webinar. Um, there have been a lot of comments on replicating these programs in other places and how people might do that and what what materials they might need to access in order to do that. So um, in our follow-up email, we'll try to make those materials available as much as possible. Um, so uh, I think that this has been a really valuable webinar and, and people are really looking forward to follow up from that. So uh, on behalf of the IFA, I wanted to say thank you to all four of our presenters um, and and uh, and thank you for taking the time to, to present your your work. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Have a thank good you. rest of your day. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.